The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hey, welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. I'm just kind of standing here waiting for something to do. Mm-mm-mm. Hey, Ben, check it out. Look what, what Miss Corbeil found. <gasps> It's the Unobtainium SNES Mini Classic. Wow. Now that we have one, you know what we can do? Yes, I do. Let's take it apart, see what's inside, talk about what we find, and also compare it to the NES Mini from last year. I wonder how similar it actually is. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired Designs. Imhotep's Priests. Regrettable Acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Look what we found. It's a Super Nintendo Classic Edition, which means it's a mini Super Nintendo. Now, some people call it an SNES, and I think that's dumb. When you can just say SNES, it saves so much time. Like, if you had a stopwatch, and like every time you say SNES, how much time that takes compared to SNES, that's like half your life out the window. So you'd be like laying in your deathbed and like, oh, well, we would have found the cure for your cancer five minutes from now, but unfortunately, you're dead. If only you had more time. Oh, Star Fox 2 is also included. So I bought a copy of Stunt Race FX, which is a Super FX cartridge, and I hacked its ROM out to make a bootleg of Star Fox 2, and I didn't think it was very good. Granted, I couldn't read any of it because it was in Japanese. All right, let's see what's inside. Is this like a poster or something? Uh, it's an unboxing, what is this? Warranty information, who cares? Remember when games came with posters? Now you're playing with superpower. Remember the 80s? Nostalgia. Hmm, looks like this is pretty simple. You plug it into a power source, and then you plug it into your TV via HDMI. I'm curious if they left the data connection on the USB port, because that's how people hacked into the previous system. Oh, look how tiny it is. Look how cute it is. Oops. <laughs> it's a portable. Well, it's a pretty good representation of the American Super Nintendo. Of course, it looks different in Japan. It's more rounded. Power button moves, reset button moves. However, the controller ports are fake. Dun, dun, dun. And look, it's the same connector from the bottom of the Wiimote and from the NES Classic. And I guess there's a little LED here. In the back, we have an HDMI out and DC in, even though it's clearly a USB port. This is surprising. It comes with two controllers. Huh. I can't remember what console it was where they stopped giving you two controllers. I want to say it was the PlayStation. So here's the big question. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. How long is the controller cord? <sighs> really? Okay, what is it that, who is it? Leonardo da Vinci? He was like, you know, this is your height, right? So, oh, geez, it's not even as tall as me. That's not good. I wonder if this is like, just laziness, like they don't localize it. Like in Japan, all the game consoles have short cables, but in other parts of the world, the cables are longer. It's just how things work. But once again, we have a short cable, like localize this. I mean, I saw the same complaint that uh, this was not localized for Europe. So the Europeans basically get the same thing as we do in America, even though their Super Nintendo games were different. Like uh, Contra is not called Contra in other countries. It's called Robo Protector, which is strange because, you know, a game that comes out in 1988 and they named it after a scandal in the U.S. government. Like that seems less appropriate than Robo Protector. But then also, uh, a lot of countries in Europe have very strict uh, laws about depictions in video games. Like uh, one of the reasons it was turned into robots is because some countries ban depictions of human on human violence. So they changed Contra to be robots instead of, uh, you know, two men shooting aliens. I guess human alien violence is also against the rules. Well, let's see, the controller feels pretty good. Maybe a little bit lighter than the original. It's probably gonna have one of those uh, I squared C chips in it. I didn't even bother with security screws. It's got very little Phillips. So one of the uh, conspiracy theories about these mini consoles was that they were just doing it to use up excess Wii parts. <laughs> That's why it has the same plug. 
But I mean, considering how expensive classic gaming has gotten, I mean, there's multiple games on this list that cost more than this console, even though this is overpriced. Uh, I remember the good old days, actually the bad old days when you didn't get HDMI cables with everything. Now they give them away like candy. And now it's like, oh man, another HDMI cable. I don't need this in my life. Well, now it's time to look into what everyone came for and that's me opening up the Super Nintendo. Uh, I just got uh, regular Phillips screws. I didn't have a Super Nintendo back in the day. I was a Genesis kid. Cause Genesis does, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. So nowadays, since Nintendo fans have rewritten all of video game history, I'm saying that completely un unironically, they have. Just like Apple fans have rewritten computer history. Bl blast processing, people now joke about it, like <laughs> blast processing. This thing was half the speed of the Sega Genesis. Also, it only had an 8-bit data bus, even though it was a 16-bit console. It was kind of weak. So I'm kind of wondering if the, um, some of the quote unquote features of the Super Nintendo, such as the magazines back in the day called it free slow motion. I mean, that should be fixed since this is an emulation. What's the oldest game on here? Uh, uh, Super Castlevania 4 had some slowdown, the, the original version, I mean. So it'd be interesting to see if that slowdown has been fixed through emulation. All right, here it comes. Oh, oh that was cut short. Oh, there's a little separate board for the uh, power switch and the reset button. Oh, there's an actual spring on there. That's, that's quality. Well, so far this is looking a lot like the inside of the mini NES Classic. Remember this RF shield along with a depression in it for the heat sink for the system on a chip. All right, well, I marked the connections for the controller. Just, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but just so we know. So let's see what's under the shield. It's got like a thermal pad on it. There we go. Okay, we are inside. This is reminding me very much of the NES Classic. In fact, we have a NES Classic here, so we can compare them. I bet it's the same thing. Because remember how I was talking about how the Super Nintendo is kind of slow? So if you can emulate a Nintendo, it's only like three times harder to emulate a Super Nintendo. Okay, we have an all winter tech R16 ARM core. Right next to it is some RAM. I guess we can type in the number of that and see how much RAM it had. I'm trying to remember how much the Nest Classic had. It had quite a bit for what it was. Then this one here, this is going to be a NAND flash device that holds your operating system in the games. Over here on the left is probably some sort of uh, power control bus arbiter thing. I guess we can look it up. And then on the back, there's one more chip which looks to be something that drives the HDMI. Yeah, actually, we could, what I think we should do is just rip open the mini NES and then compare them directly. Hope I don't get them mixed up. <laughs> it's a wacky mix up. I took apart a mini NES classic and look what I found. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Notice anything similar? Hmm. Yeah, I remember Nintendo couldn't you know, manage to manufacture enough of these, even though they're still manufacturing it. Um, let's see how obvious we can make this. <laughs> Your Honor, I rest my case. In fact, I had to label this one SNES. I mean, there's some small differences. There's uh, like an unpopulated header here that isn't doing anything. It's like 95% the same. It certainly fits in the same form factor. It has the same controller plugs. Um, the chips are probably even the same. They probably just, you know, did a slight change on the board and then, well, let's take a look. There's my magnifying glass. Let's look at the flash. It is the same. <laughs> let's look at the RAM. Oh, the RAM is different. It's a different uh, vendor. It might be actually more RAM. We'll have to check. Okay, so it's same form factor, a different vendor at least. Um, what's this other chip over here? It's power control chip. That's the same. 
Let's look on the back, HDMI chip. It is also the same. So the only thing different about these systems is the chip they used for the RAM. And Felix is looking up the chips right now. Although Felix, the only one we need to look up is the RAM chip. The rest are the same. All right, so the original Nest Classic had a two gigabit RAM, lowercase b. So that's two divided by eight, which is 256 megs of RAM. The Super Nintendo Mini has a four gigabit RAM. That's the only difference in the hardware. So four uh, megabit RAM means it has 512 megabytes of RAM. I guess that makes sense because it's lowercase b, so it's uh, bits, not bytes. So you should always check that in your, in your data sheets, which makes sense because if you think about it, like if you have a, uh, a Raspberry Pi Zero can emulate all sorts of consoles and it only has one gig of RAM, 256, even 256 is probably more than you need. But uh, yeah, because you're talking about games that are like at most, at most, maybe 16, no, not even that. Like prob probably the largest Super Nintendo ROM size was maybe four megs. Yeah, if anything, that extra RAM on the system is probably used for emulation and overhead or like emulating the uh, Super FX chip and the other uh, associated processors on the chip. Although you probably would have been able to emulate the Super Nintendo with this older system. I don't think half the RAM would really be that big of a deal. It probably was more like, hey, you know, these two gigabit RAM chips are kind of obsolete. Uh, here's, now they're four gigabit and they're the same price. That's probably a more likely scenario. I'm not a Nintendo apologist. I've, you know, I, I like Nintendo, but I also remember Nintendo. I remember the chip shortages of 1988 and the Wii shortages of two Christmases in a row. Yeah, so why couldn't they make more NES Minis? Because they're basically doing the same system for the SNES. Yeah, I guess the next question is, how much of an upgrade are they gonna have to put on this to emulate the N64? Because you're talking about like Super Nintendo, it's like a 3.5 megahertz system, fairly slow. And then when you go to the N64, you're jumping up to like a 100 megahertz system. It's a pretty big leap in technology. Uh, yeah, I guess let us know in the comments below. Uh, what is, I mean, I've never done like Nintendo 64 emulation on a computer. Like, what does it take? Obviously it would take more than a Super Nintendo, but how much more? Well, I'd better put this Nintendo Mini back together before I get these boards switched up. What I should probably do is um, Star Trek it, right? So I'm going to draw a face on this board, but it has a goatee. So you know what dimension it's from. Karen was saying a lot of people online want me to make a portable version of the Super Nintendo Classic. I'm not sure if that's the best idea. I mean, look at this board. You know what this is much larger than? That's right, a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is like what? One third this size? Also with the Raspberry Pi Zero, we're not locked into HDMI. We actually have other video output options. So I think I might do that in an upcoming episode because I've wanted to do a Raspberry Pi LCD episode anyway. We've done it in the past using the Adafruit spy screens, but those have fairly low update rate for the screen. I think if we do a direct LCD drive, we could get really good performance and a very compact design. Cause like with this, you're pretty much, you have to go to like a 720 screen. That's the minimum size screen you could hook up to this. And how small do HDMI screens actually get? I mean, the smallest I can think of is like maybe like a monitor for one of these cameras about like that. You're not gonna find an HDMI screen like this. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it'd be cool if this was portable. It's definitely small enough, but I think we might be better served by a Raspberry Pi. So look for that in an upcoming episode. Well, Felix, I tore apart the SNES Mini Classic and it's the same thing as the NES Mini Classic, but with a different shell. It is pretty cool that we were able to get one so you could take it apart. Yeah, I had heard it had the same processor. I just wasn't expecting it to be this identical, but I guess that's how you make money by not spending it. Well, that's all we have for today. What did you think about this teardown? Are there other classic consoles or new consoles you'd like to see us tear down? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Hey, maybe we should like play this thing now. Like, well, put it back together. Oh, play yeah. It. yeah. Nintendo manufactures scarcity. We have a special guest with us today. I am uh, Todd Rogers, known as the King of Video Games, and I am credited with having the longest held video gaming world record. Now there's been some debate about that record because people are basically creating mathematical models that are showing it's not possible. 
What we're going to do today is use Todd's information and plug it into my system. We've made hardware that can hook up to a real Atari, so we can plug these theories into the hardware and have it play it on real hardware. So we can repeat the kind of gameplay he did back in the 1980s. Tell me if the first pop feels good, okay? 